right, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you today. Last week, Pastor Jesse uh, was here, and he uh, always is trying to one-up me, so that's, that's just that's how it is, I guess. Um, but one of the things he talked to you about was our uh, community center that we are developing uh, right across the pedestrian walkway. And the, <clears throat> so i just to give you some uh, info on that, that is happening, that is, uh, we should be, si- we're supposed to sign on the building already, but there's always delays with these things. And so hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, we will take possession of that property. It's a big moment for us because it'll give us quite a bit of uh, control over the space here in downtown Lynn. Uh, we can uh, prevent certain exploitive things from happening, and we can create good things uh, at the same time, which is a, a unique position for us to be in. And uh, this is not a free project. It's not like they're just handing us the building. So there will be uh, a campaign here uh, next month about helping us to to pay for that project coming up. But there's another project that we are working on that in many ways, is already front-ended on the financial cost of it. And uh, if you just happen to have a multifamily house that you are selling, please let me know, all right, Uh, in the city of Lynn. Or if you happen to be a landlord uh, in the city of Lynn and have lots of studio or one-bedroom apartments, please let me know. We need uh, 24, 24 units. Uh, immediately, and so that would be really, really helpful. Yeah, so if you don't know, don't tell me about somebody you know. Like, I'm only talking if you know. Uh, otherwise, I'll have like 5,000. I know a guy that, I don't want the guy that's going to sell me his house out of the back of his trunk, <laughs> all right? So we, that's, where, that's where we're at. So uh, help us with that, and uh, pray for us accordingly as well as we try to tackle some housing issues here in the city of Lynn. So the first 30 years of my life, uh, some of you are old enough to know about this. Others of you are not. So watch, enjoy this uh, trip down memory lane or this exposure to something new and weird. Uh, the first 30 years of my life, if I wanted to go somewhere, I had to ask for directions. You, you looked into a, a giant book called The Yellow Pages. And uh, it, really, this is true. You, you, you would say, okay, I want to go to a restaurant. So you would open up the Yellow Pages to the restaurant category. And... There would just be names of restaurants uh, there, and it would give you the address and the phone number for those restaurants. And, and since you didn't have Google to help you out, you would actually do something that is really unbelievable that people used to do. You would pick up the phone and call the restaurant. <laughs> not, not text, not message, not direct message, an actual phone call to another human being, from one human to another human, and you would say to this human, hello, I'm looking for directions to your restaurant. The person on the other end of the line would then enter into a back and forth conversation with you where they would figure out first where you were. And then if they didn't know, then you'd have to explain where you were. And then they would try to help you arrive at their establishment where you didn't know where it was either. You can see the potential flaws in this, this uh, plan, okay? But either way, you would get into your car with your scribbled down notes and directions and knowing where to go, and you would go off into the great unknown, and inevitably you would get lost. And you would find yourself doing the walk of shame into a gas station to ask the attendant to help you get unlost. Okay? This is just how it was back in the day. Back in those days, The real job of the gas station attendant was not to watch out for the snacks and Red Bulls. Rather, it was to help people find their way when they were lost. They were the ancient sages of the highways and back roads of every town in America in the last century. Now, if you were real fancy, you would get yourself a book of maps for the whole country. And you would look with a magnifying glass and try to figure it out. Or if you had AAA, you could, and you're going on a road trip, you could call AAA in advance, tell them where you're going, and they would send you this thing called a trip tick. They had the pre-maps all lined out. But from time to time, things would get crossed and the miscommunications would happen. And you would get to the spot that you were supposed to be at only to realize that something was wrong. And you were not actually in the place 
that you were trying to get to. You were not in the right place, and now you're lost. You got no cell phone to call anybody. There's no pay phone on the corner. You don't have a quarter, even if you wanted to. Now, let's talk about this today. What do you do when you get lost? What do you do when you need directions and you're not sure where to go? In life, not on the road. What happens in life when everything you thought you knew isn't quite what you thought it was? Well, when the normal way to figure stuff out doesn't seem to be working anymore and life starts falling apart. Or when you upgrade to the latest Google Maps app in life and it still doesn't get you where you thought you were going to go. You upgraded, but it didn't work out. Or when life has a hiccup, because we all know life always has hiccups. Most of us can't make it a week or a day without there being a life hiccup. But for some reason, we still didn't see it coming. The rules of life have changed, and it seems like nobody's given you the new rules. Or when someone you've trusted for the last three years betrays you and become a great disappointment to you, what do you do then? What do you do when you're lost? What do you do when you're wandering? What do you do when you have no idea how to get out of the situation that you're in? What do you do when your old street smarts now harm you more than help you? What do you do when your previous days look like they were your best days and your future days seem to be getting worse and worse? At that point, where do you go for directions? In those moments, how do you make a good decision? Who's the ancient sage that you need to go talk to in that moment? Well, we're going to be talking about this today, how to make a hard decision in a complicated and broken moment. Let's go ahead and make sure that we understand a couple of core assumptions to inform the process before we jump back into our uh, Acts, or as we continue our Acts series. Then we'll jump into the example from Acts. In Matthew chapter 6, 33, the first core assumption is this verse. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I know we're in a scripture memory season right now, and you can add this to your list of verses in the Bible to memorize. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All the stuff you need, you don't got to worry about. You focus on God and his kingdom, and he takes care of the rest. Let me state this. All pursuits, what does this mean? All pursuits that don't start oriented towards God and his kingdom will ultimately lead to disappointment. That's the fundamental meaning there. And what is this kingdom of God and his righteousness? What is that? Well, we've been talking about it for years. It's good news to the poor, healing for the broken, freedom for the captive, and justice for the oppressed. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. One of the things to pay attention here, to here is that whatever is happening on this earth, whatever the currency or the, the high-value stuff of this earth is, in this world is eternally irrelevant. So our focus needs to be eternally oriented towards God, his kingdom, his purposes. That's the point. Now, just imagine, go back quite some time, and you were living in the South, the Deep South, during the Civil War, and you had accumulated large amounts of Confederate currency. And through a series of events, you become convinced that the South is about to lose the war, and your money is soon going to be worthless. What would you do? Well, if you had any common sense, you would get rid of your Confederate money. And you would put your every penny you could into the currency that is about to come and prepare yourself for the end of the war. Now, this passage in uh, Matthew 6, when Jesus is talking, fundamentally says that we need to be investing in the currency of heaven. The world economy is going down. Your wallet, your Venmo, your 401k account is full of soon-to-be useless currency. The currency, that's encouraging, huh? The currency of this world will be worth nothing when you die. You're probably going to die. Just saying. Or when Christ returns, it's going to be worth nothing. And both of those things could happen at any moment. The passage helps us orient ourselves to our true north of God, to assess 
whether or not the challenge we are facing, our lost moment, our wandering moment, the difficult situation, whatever it is we're running through or dealing with, it helps us to assess whether or not that challenge we're facing is even a situation that we should be involved with on any level at all. The next assumption is this, that wisdom is available from God to the undivided. James chapter 1 says this, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. Now, a lot of people memorize this, this passage and they stop memorizing right there and they don't finish out the thought. They don't finish out what's really being said here in this text. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He will give it to you. There's some conditions here. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a, per do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So that's a rough verse, James. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. So the, the assumption here, the second assumption is wisdom is available to all of us from God if we are undivided. But if your loyalty is divided between this world and its trolls and its trinkets and its toking moments, then it's going to be a rough ride. And you're going to find yourself misled, lost, and directionless. That's the nature of this life. So now we're jumping into the Acts, uh, Acts 1, chapter 12. We're continuing on. Then the apostles, and this is, sorry, this is an account of a really difficult moment for the earliest Christians and how they navigated through a very difficult decision they had to make. This is right after Jesus has ascended to heaven. This is after Jesus, like just a few weeks earlier, Jesus had been crucified. Jesus had risen from the dead. Uh, he had spent some time with his, uh, the early Christians, his disciples, and, and, and those that followed. And at the, right before this moment, Jesus has ascended into heaven. Verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile. Somebody say half a mile. Half a mile. Okay. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those that were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Why are they going to Jerusalem? Let's start there. The disciples watch Jesus ascend to heaven, and the first thing they do is they go to Jerusalem. They're going to Jerusalem very simply. This is not rocket science today, friends. They go to Jerusalem because Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem. Actually, uh, he told them to stay in Jerusalem. This is the same place. Jerusalem is the same place where just a few weeks earlier, the leaders in Jerusalem had killed their leader. Now Jesus wants them to hang out in the same place with the same people. Just think about this. It probably wasn't the easiest of all decisions. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus had told them what to do. Once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit. Notice this. Immediately after Jesus ascends to heaven, the disciples' first act was to simply obey the most basic of things that Jesus had said. There's two parts there. Obey and the most basic of things. Jesus had said, don't leave Jerusalem until, but they were not currently in Jerusalem. So they hurried over to Jerusalem because they weren't there. It says a half mile. These little seemingly insignificant things in the Bible always crack me up. 
the, the half mile distance. It actually doesn't say half mile. It says a Sabbath day's walk, which is just less than a mile. But most of us have no sense of this because most of us don't even hit 2,000 steps a day on our pedometer or our Google, the Traxxas, all right? So we're like, we're so, we don't, that sounds like a long way. It's not a long way. But what is going on here is the Bible is filled with all kinds of idioms and cultural expressions that uh, sometimes the Bible translations just translate what it means for us so that we don't stumble over it. And that's what's happening here. Basically, the idea is they went. They went to Jerusalem because Jesus said so. Because Jesus said so, that's what they did. It was simple. It was basic. It would have been easy to overlook if they had set up a committee to decide what to do on the top of that mountain when Jesus ascended, they would have said, let's go someplace safe where it's nice and we don't have to confront anything. That's what they would have said. But they didn't. They just did what Jesus told them to do. Let's get this taken care of first. You can't get complicated things sorted out in your life until you get the basic things right first. So many people want to excel at the crazy stuff out there when they haven't learned to excel at the basic things first. You will see in a moment that they're about to make a critical decision. But in order to make critical decisions well in life, we must build on one good decision and then another good decision and then another good decision. You don't build a, uh, you don't build a giant house on a bad foundation. You've got to have the good decision first. If the first decision that you made was founded in disobedience, then everything else following is going to be corrupted and at risk of collapse. That is fundamentally the truth. Excel at the basics of obedience first. Complicated decisions require an honest evaluation of the foundation that that situation is based upon. And basic obedience is foundational. Verse 15, continuing on in the story. During this time, when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit, speaking through King David. Judas was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. Leave verse 17 on the screen. Judas was one of the 12 disciples, and Judas is the one who betrayed Jesus and turned Jesus over to be crucified. Judas was that disciple that took all the trust that he'd been given, and he betrayed it for silver. Now, a lot of times, Judas just becomes the enemy in the story or, or the bad guy, but I want you to think about this for a moment. What, I wonder what the disciples felt about this. What, what do you do when somebody you trust messes up? What do you do when you're authentically betrayed by someone who you deeply loved or admired, a partner or a mentor or a hero? Think about that just for a second. It must have been tough. I mean, do you give up and say, oh, Judas, I guess none of this is real. Not real. Do you surrender? I mean, it's painful to lose a friend. It's painful. It also was probably pretty embarrassing that someone you thought was your ride or die was just a greedy traitor. That, that hits you in a different place. And on top of it all, Judas killed himself. After the whole situation, it says in verse 18, Judas had bought a field with the money he received from his treachery. Falling head first there, his body split open, spilling out all his intestines. Luke, Luke wrote this. I think he was still a little hot under the collar when he wrote this. Like, he was like, he wanted to like, just, just blow Judas up all the way, just like tell you all the gory details. He was still working on some forgiveness. The, the news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name, Akeldama, which means the field of blood. 
get this, the disciples must have been furious, hurt, scared, angry. They had all the feelings, and they were wrestling through it. I would imagine that they were sad and confused as well. Because Judas had taken his failure into his own hands afterwards by suicide. The disciples did not even have the chance to restore him. Remember, Peter, the guy talking in this text, had also betrayed Jesus. And Jesus sought him out and restored him. Had Judas not taken things into his own hands, it would have been the clear pattern for Jesus to restore him as well. That's hard to get your head around. There's a lot of reasons why it might be complicated to think about. But this is the posture of Jesus, is to restore those who the enemy has deceived. So what do you do when someone has failed you? Well, in this situation, we see what they did. They looked to the Word of God. Verse 20, Peter continued. This was written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it, talking about Judas. It also says, let someone else take his position, giving them instruction on what they're supposed to do. These were quotes from Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 that they had understood as messianic prophecies, meaning these were prophetic things that King David wrote because the Holy Spirit asked him to write these songs. So it would make a lot of sense that Peter would look in the places in the Old Testament or the places in their Bible to see what it is they should do. Because so much of what had already taken place up to this point in their experience with Jesus was that it was stated in the Bible. So in this moment, this messianic song that the Holy Spirit gave to King David contains the answer on what to do next. They were in a tricky situation on what to do about Judas' departure, and they needed direction on what to do next. So they looked to the Word of God, and then they did what it said. Watch watch what happens next. Verse 21. This is how this plays out. So now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. From the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Two men. Then they all prayed. All Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen. As an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs, still a little angry. Then they, call, then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. It's very interesting here. The, the casting lots thing that we see there that they did is the modern equivalent of drawing straws. Can I tell you? Never in my life have I drawn straws. I don't even know what that is. But it's more like flipping a quarter or rolling dice. Just, it was just something that they did to decide what to do. But they didn't just make it up. This was very intentional that they cast lots. This goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, where you see a story in Leviticus or uh, um, the rule in Leviticus about something called the scapegoat, where every year they would take two pure, unblemished goats, and one of them would be required to be sacrificed to make atonement for the people of Israel for their sins. Now, this unusual Old Testament law that many people have never read, because when you read Leviticus, you make it past chapter 2, and you're like, I don't know about this one. I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this, okay? So a lot of people don't actually make it all the way through. So they don't get to this one. But this unusual Old Testament law, turns out, was a setup. It was a universal setup for Jesus to become our sacrificial scapegoat. 
He becomes our scapegoat. He takes away the sins of the whole world. Okay, so it's a throwback all the way to Leviticus. So once again, inside the story in Acts, we see the story of picking a New Testament apostle is a hint back at Jesus being in the Bible already. Here's the verse, uh, verse 8 from Leviticus. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness. I way oversimplified it, but if you really want to read it, Leviticus 16, go ahead. Here we have... Here we have this, this phrase where it says he is to cast sacred lots. And so it seems like it's an odd connection to go all the way back to Leviticus to do it, but they were making these connections that Jesus was the Savior of the world. That there was all this sacrificial stuff. There was all this scapegoat stuff happening. So how does all of this help us when we need to make, when we need direction or need to make an important decision? This is critical here. And this is, we're just going to pull it all together here right at the end. Watch closely. First one is this. There are six things that took place in this story. The first thing they did was they acknowledged the truth. They didn't pretend like this didn't bother them. Judas really did hurt them, and Judas really did betray them. That was a fact. That is what occurred. They acknowledged the truth. Second, they came together. In unity, in purpose, they came together. Do you know what our proclivity to do is? when we have a really difficult moment in life, a difficult decision to make, this is what most people do now. Instead of coming together, we isolate. Going through something hard, you're going to isolate and just kind of grind it out. Figure it out. You always figured it out before. You're tough. You can do it. And you just isolate, which is literally the opposite of what we're supposed to do. It is the least healthy thing to do in that moment. So they came together in unity with purpose, and they came together also to counsel each other, right? So they, they, they're, they're all aware here. They're all, they're all in this together. Third thing was they looked to the Word. The Bible is the final rule for life and conduct. In case you didn't know that, if you are struggling with something and you're not quite sure what to do and you look into the Word of God and the Word of God says this is the correct path and you are going down that path, your path needs to change so that you do the path that the Word of God says because the Bible is the final rule. It's like the final authority. It's, it's not just a book of general ideas. It's not just like a compilation of TED Talks in there. This is the final rule. Now, sometimes you come across stuff that's hard. You're like, ow, whoa. I don't like that. Welcome to the club. Lots of things you're not going to like because we are fallen and broken and wicked-hearted people. And the Bible is bringing correction to us. All other opposing ideas are to be rejected. Fourth, seek the Lord. It says they prayed. They prayed. Now, in this moment, you'll notice that when they prayed, it wasn't a long prayer. It wasn't a 17-hour prayer meeting. It wasn't an all-night prayer gathering. Not at this point. This was, they were following the instructions, doing what they were supposed to do. They prayed. They committed it to God. Asked for his help. And then the fifth thing was they followed counsel. As the worship team comes up. They followed the counsel of God through his word. You know, they, that means they obeyed, right? So there's obedience and there's execution. They're doing. They didn't just hear. They actually did. So they're following his counsel. And six, and this is where the casting lots part comes in. They entrusted the outcome to God. So in this moment, they realize, hey, both of these guys seem good to us. So God... Here you go. 
and they entrusted the outcome to God. That's critically important. As you wrestle with these decisions that you need to make, and you've done all this work, and finally, you feel that you have your marching orders, and then you just simply have to entrust it to God. Because at the end of the day, I'm not God, and you're not God, only God is God. Why don't you stand with me as we close? I know some of you are shook that I'm not God. The, uh, so. We all have decisions to make, all of us. We all get moments where we're confused or have tricky things going on. And sometimes it's normal, everyday life, stuff like, do I stay or do I move? Do I start a, this relationship or do I end a relationship? Do I, is it time for me to slow down in life or is it time for me to double down and go all in? Is it time for me to go out and look for help? It doesn't always have to be complicated, right? Some, some of these are just simple decisions that we're just confused about. <clears throat> but can I tell you that in my life, when I have done this well, and of course I don't always do it well, when I've done it well, the answers are so frequently simple. It's things like go or here or now or wait or not yet or never or breathe or forgive or release, permit, forbid, prepare or build develop or we're just getting started let's go whatever it is when you find yourself lost and wandering or stuck or confused or overwhelmed if your past is a barricade for you and your future is bleak all of these things are things we simply bring to Jesus bring to Jesus today and take those steps that we talked about let's start today let's give some of these things to Jesus today that you're, you're wrestling with, that you're in a moment of decision about. The altars are open. Let's spend some time praying today.